Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch and welcome to my kitchen. Today we are going to be taste testing squash and I am also going to be pressure canning some for the winter. We are going to be taste testing the Cinderella pumpkin, the Georgia candy roaster, and I mistakenly called this squash a geet okasamen. They're very similar in size and shape, but the geet okasamen is more orange than this one and doesn't have the blue tip on the end. A peanut pumpkin. This is a small one of the pumpkins that I have. I have some that are absolutely humongous, but to just show you what these look like, I just brought one of the small ones in to make it easier on myself. We have a buttercup squash. This one's Burgess buttercup and a butternut squash as well. All I have done to cook these up is to cut them up into slices like these and put a little bit of butter on them. That's it. I baked them at 350 for an hour and they are now ready to taste test. Before we get into the taste test though, I just wanted to talk to you about ripening tomatoes on your kitchen counter. I mentioned that I would share this in my video from two days ago and I forgot to do that. So I wanted to show you what we do. So we just use a lid of a box and we layer our tomatoes one layer thick. So the reason that I don't layer them on top of each other is because as they ripen, they get soft and the pressure from the ones above or the weight from the ones above can actually squish the ones below. So I just find it's easier to do it like this and they more evenly ripen. You can take these downstairs and stick them on your pantry shelf. You can put them on your kitchen table, which is generally what I do. The nice thing about having these somewhere that you're going to be seeing them every day is that as they ripen, as you can see here, I have a couple that are ripening. You can take these ones out and throw them into the freezer until they're all ripened and then you can process them all at once. I just have a box in my freezer that I wash these off, pull the ends off and just throw them right in. I don't have a lid on it or anything because I'm planning on processing them within the next week or two. So I don't have to worry about freezer burn or anything like that. So I'm going to set these aside. And then one more thing, my sweet potatoes, and I keep showing this one because it's the biggest one and it's the one I'm most proud of, but most of them are more this size. And several of you let me know that you actually need to cure these for at least 10 days before you eat them because this, the sweet flavor of them actually develops over time. And from everything that I've read, the best way to cure them is to put them in a box um, only one layer, the same as the, as the tomatoes, and put them in a bright window but not in direct sunlight and that needs to stay quite warm in order for them to cure. So that is what I'm going to do, but when we eat these, I'll bring you guys along and I'll let you know how they taste. Let's give these squash a taste test. So the first one that we're going to do is the Burgess buttercup. And I do know that the buttercup squash tend to be a lot more dry than some of the other squash, which actually makes it really good for soup. I used these to make a curry soup the other day and it was absolutely fabulous, really, really good. And these ones also tend to have a really complex flavor. So let's give it a try. Mm, that has to be one of my favorite squash. Super dry though. Such amazing flavor. The next one we're going to try is the peanut pumpkin. That's the one with this texture on the outside of the skin. And I can tell you right now, there are a lot of sugars in it because they've come out the bottom and they're all sticky. So let's give this one a try. It's not as meaty as the buttercup squash and definitely not as I would say complex of a flavor. It's kind of a more simple flavor, but it is really sweet and it would probably make excellent pumpkin pie. This is the Cinderella pumpkin. So that's the bright orange one, this beautiful pumpkin. And I have grown these for a couple of years now and I do really like them. Let's give this one a go. There is absolutely no question that the flavor of this peanut pumpkin compared to the Cinderella pumpkin is far superior, much more sweet, delicate, absolutely scrumptious. But this one has this one on texture. This one has more of a meaty texture, a little bit more similar to the buttercup squash. What I'm thinking is that mixing these two pumpkins together to make a pumpkin pie would probably be perfection because <clears throat> 
you'd have the meatier texture of this with the sweetness of this. But side by side, I definitely think that the um, peanut pumpkin takes the cake on that one, or the pie, I guess, rather. Now for the standby butternut squash. Look at the caramelization on the bottom of that. So this is most people's favorite squash, I would say. I'm definitely more of a butter nut than I am a butter cup. These ones are usually a close second for me, so let's give it a try. That's just about perfect. Oh my goodness, that is really good. I don't know if I like the peanut pumpkin or if I like the butter cup better. They're both really good. Really, really good. This set definitely has more of what I would say like a squashy flavor and this one more of a pumpkin flavor, but they're both good. So I'm going to stick those ones up here. Those two are, are my faves so far. Lastly, we have the Georgia candy roaster. So let's give this one a try. Oh my word. That is the most perfect flavored squash. I feel like this, the um, candy roaster has a texture that's very similar to the butter cup squash, but not quite as dry with the sweetness of the peanut pumpkin and a very similar flavor to the butter nut squash. The candy roaster might be the best. The one that I can say just doesn't match up at all to the rest of these is the Cinderella pumpkin. So it's a good one and I think if you were to eat it on your own and didn't have something to directly compare it to, which is the way that I've been doing it for three years, it seems like a really great pumpkin and they're nice because they don't grow massive and they're a beautiful pumpkin, absolutely gorgeous. They also store well, but in a direct comparison taste test like this, they just do not hold up to the peanut pumpkin or actually any of these other squash. If you had asked me before doing this, I would have said that the butternut or the buttercup were probably my favorite, but the candy roaster is better. Mm. So good, so good. Now that we are done that, let's get on to canning up some of this pumpkin and we're gonna be eating that for lunch. I'll give you some basics on pressure canning as we go through this video. I absolutely love pressure canning. I use an all-American canner that holds seven quarts um, or seven quart jars. I got this one on Facebook Marketplace for I think it was around a hundred dollars and since then I have actually seen uh, several of these on Marketplace but they're always gone really really fast so it's important to keep an eye on it because I know the All-Americans are super expensive to buy new but I absolutely love this canner. One of the things that I really love about it is the fact that you don't need a seal on it so even, so there's no risk of the seal going bad or anything like that or having to replace it. But just all in all, this canner works really, really well. So this is what we'll be using today. What I did in preparation is I peeled all of my squash and then took all of the seeds out, which some of my kids wanted to do some roasting with those later on. So I've put them aside to save for that. And then we have cut them into one inch cubes. It's really important when you are canning anything like this, but particularly with stuff that you're putting in the pressure canner, that everything that's going into the jar is around the same size. Otherwise you can end up with inconsistent consistency in those pieces. So you can have some really mushy ones, ones that aren't so mushy and things like that. So keeping them around one inch cube is perfect. One of the tricks with canning is to make sure that everything that you're using is around the same temperature. So your jars, your product that's going in the jars and then the water that you're going to be putting your jars into. Otherwise you can end up with jars cracking. And we have all our jars clean. When you are pressure canning, it is not necessary to sterilize your jars because they are going to be going into the canner under high pressure and high heat and that kills off absolutely anything that you would ever have to worry about in your jars. Pressure canning is definitely the safest method of canning. In my opinion, there are just certain things that I won't pressure can. Jam, for instance, pickles, anything that's canned in high vinegar, 
um, that I can just do short processing times on. I never use pressure counter for, but for most other things I do. Once your squash are cooked, you're going to need a funnel and you're going to want to ladle your squash cubes into your jars. I use this for making soup. I use it for um, mashing up and adding into muffins or uh, breads or anything like that. Once I have these all jarred up, I'm going to top them with hot water and then I'll put them in the canner and they will can for 90 minutes at 15 pounds of pressure. We live at 3,200 feet above sea level, so we always use the highest level of pressure that is recommended in any recipe. The an expression that you'll hear when you're putting your lids on your jars is something called finger tight. I'm going to need something to hold these with because they are hot. And that is where you take the tips of your fingers and tighten your lid down about that tight. Don't put your hand down on the top of the jar like this and tighten it because you'll get it too tight. You do want a tiny bit of space for any air in the jar to release from. The other thing that you want to do is to remove any air bubbles from your jars like so and leave one inch of headspace. Into your pressure counter your jars go and you want two inches of water in the bottom of your pressure counter. And something else that you can do is add a little bit of vinegar into your canner like so, just a little splash. If you use too much vinegar, you will start to rust and corrode your lids. So just a little splash and that will help remove any hard water that might form stains on your jars. These canners have a little mark on the side of the canner and a little arrow on the lid here and you just line those up. Make sure that it's nice and lined up. And then the way I tighten these is just how you would lug nuts on a car. You do them across from each other, tighten those down, across from each other again and across again. And then just like with lug nuts, go around, give them a final twist to make sure that they're all nice and tight. Once the steam starts coming out of this vigorously, I'll show you what that looks like. We're going to set the timer for 10 minutes so that the canner can vent for 10 minutes before we put our weight on. But I'll show you each one of these steps because I do know that when I first started pressure canning, it was really intimidating just because there's a, there is a bit of a danger factor involved. The weight for this canner looks just like this. So there's five, 10 and 15 pounds. Like I said, based on our elevation, I always use the 15 pound, no matter what it is that I am canning. And these will can for 90 minutes at 15 pounds of pressure. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see the steam coming out of there, but you can hear it. So that is the sound that you're looking for when you want to set your timer. So when it starts whistling like that and the steam starts coming out and I can see it, but you guys probably can't see it on the, on the camera. So now I'm going to set my timer. Maybe you can, if I go back like that, can you see the steam coming up there? So now I'm going to set my timer for 10 minutes and then I'll put the weight on when the timer goes off. Okay, so this part is always the part that's probably the scariest and that is putting the weight on top of that steaming vent. So you just do it quickly and carefully. Just like so. So now what I'm watching for is the gauge to show me it's at 15 pounds of pressure up here. Hear that sound? So that has told me that it's now up to pressure and sure enough, we're at 15 pounds of pressure here. So now I'm going to turn this down and I set mine at around two, um, just above the lowest setting it'll go. And what I'm wanting is I want that little weight to jiggle two to three times per minute. And you don't have to be exact about this, but just roughly you want it to jiggle, then have a pause, then jiggle again, pause again, jiggle again. And that just shows that it's staying at a consistent temperature. It's really important that once your canner reaches the pressure it needs to be at, that it stays that. If it drops down below that, you actually need to start your timer all over again. But mine is at 15 pounds of pressure. I'm setting my timer for 90 minutes. Once your canner has come back down to zero, 
You can remove the weight and be careful it can be hot. Mine's cooled down quite a bit so I can take it off with my bare hands. I always wait till it's done making any kind of noise. And then you can undo the lid and carefully remove your jars. Let your jars sit on the counter for 24 hours before removing the rings and putting them into storage. That is it for me today, guys. I'm going to go fill my belly with some squash. I hope that you have a fabulous day and I'll see you again next time. Bye. Do you guys want some?